Okay, I'm here. Wonderful. Um, so I will get started, and uh, I'll start off pretty easy with this. Um, could you just tell me a little bit about your uh, current tour? Um, well, it's not really a tour. Uh, the, the way we operate in America is we, we usually go out and do you know, three or four dates in a certain area and then come back again. So I think we've got four dates around Ohio coming up. And uh, then we come back and then we're going to do some dates around Chicago in September. Then I'm doing a proper tour of the UK in October and November where we're doing, I think, 16 shows. Because you can't come home if you're playing it, you know, Scotland or something. It's it's just too far. But if it's um, if it's anywhere in America, you you just fly out and do it, and then come back again for a while. Interesting. So for a while, you've kind of done this like breaking off into smaller pieces, so you're able to kind of. Yeah, I mean, it it just works better than being, uh, you know, but it works better for me than you know attempting to go out and stay out for a month or two. <laughs> It, it it gets a little old if you do that, so uh, you want to keep it fresh. Yeah, I was going to ask a little bit later, but it kind of makes sense now. I, I would imagine touring has changed quite a bit over the years. So it's it's changed bad. completely. I mean, well, it, it, with COVID, it all went away for two years, and I think pretty much everybody stopped doing it for a while. You know, we just started again this year. Uh, but yes, touring has changed. I mean, it was never easy. Um, uh, the you know the playing is absolutely fine. I'd probably do that for free. It's the traveling which uh, you get paid for because ninety six percent of this job is about getting in and out of cars and going to, going to and from airports and checking in and out of hotels and packing and unpacking and trying to get your laundry done. I mean this is actually you know th this is as I said about ninety six percent of the job. So um, you know that's the difficult bit. Uh, standing on a stage and twanging the guitar is relatively easy. <laughs> Fair. I was going to say, do you have to kind of build up stamina over the years doing doing this so you can maintain that like long of a <laughs> Um I, I think it's uh, it, it just becomes something you do. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's ingrained in me after you know over half a century. You know, if the schedule says get up uh, and go to the airport and go to Cincinnati, then you just do. Um, you know, I, I just I don't question it. I mean, there are uh, there are a handful of people who are a little dodgy, and uh, you know, they don't always turn up. <laughs> but uh, you know, we've got a reputation for uh, you know getting there. You know, through hell or high water. Um, you know, the, the, I suppose once in a blue moon, and especially now. With the impossible, you know, airline schedules and people losing luggage left, right, and center and canceling flights, it's actually a lot trickier right now at this very moment uh, because you don't know if you're going to arrive in uh, where you where you're trying to get to. I mean, you have, you have no idea, and people get stranded. A lot of people I know, I mean, get stranded all the time. You know? <laughs> I, I've made it to the last six gigs on 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 time. Uh, so you know, I, maybe we're due for a disaster in, in Ohio because uh, you know everybody is facing that problem right now. You know, can we actually physically get there? And getting from you know getting from one town, if you're in Cleveland or something, and you've got to go get to Florida. I mean, it's just not that easy. You know, you might have to take a few different planes, and every time you take uh, an extra plane, it's another chance for your luggage to get lost. You know? So. Uh, that's happened to me quite a lot uh, over the years. You know, you'll land in the worst one was Italy. Uh, landed in Rome to do do a show, and you know the bag had gone and nobody could find it. Um, so you know, I go to the. It was a television show. It's even worse. <laughs> and so I arrived and I wasn't shaved and I didn't have a clean shirt and uh, hadn't done my hair and and they, you know I looked like I just slept in a hedge or something and. Uh, I, I said, well, don't worry, you know, between now and tomorrow, either my bag will turn up or I'll just buy a whole new, you know, like um, a, a wardrobe. Um, and at the very last moment, the, guy, the, the bag did turn up. And I remember I was in uh, actually Key West in Florida and they lost my guitar, uh, which is actually more serious because <laughs> you can always buy new clothes. Um, and it and I was I went to the gig and I'm standing around the gig. I did I what am I going to do? do you know, tell stories? Do it a cappella? I mean I don't have a guitar. And um, at the I think probably about six o'clock in the evening, you know, like an hour before the show, the guitar actually turned up. 
And so I did the show, but, <laughs> you know, there have been some nail biters there. But I think, you know, if you talk to anybody who does this business and, and everybody can tell you the same stories, you know, we just live in a in an age where nothing is really running the, the way it should do. So you just try your best, you know. Uh, and if I'm stranded in uh, Nova Scotia or something <laughs> when I'm supposed to be in Kent uh, stage, then, uh, you know, apologies. But, the, you know, the, I am totally at the mercy of the airlines at the moment. Yeah, fair enough. It sounds like a lot of this is just sort of luck and then doing the best you can in rough situations. Yeah. I mean, I haven't, I haven't missed any gigs yet, but, um, you know, it's I, I know so many people who have uh, because they just physically can't get there. Um People are coming up with ingenious solutions, you know, they're, you know, they're driving across the country just to make sure they're there or taking a train or whatever. But, you know, there are no guarantees with any of it. Anyway, uh, I don't think you really want to know about the hardships of travel. <laughs> oh, so interesting to hear. Um, what should people expect for the, uh, the Ohio shows? Oh, well, the Ohio shows, um, it, it's interesting. I've been working with um, a young band out of uh, Chicago called The Empty Pockets. Um, for years and years and years, I, I was doing an acoustic show where there were just two acoustic guitars on stage and did that for about 20 years. Um, and then about five years ago, I hooked up with the, the pockets. And so all of a sudden, uh, you know, like a, I've become a, a rock band again, <laughs> whereas I was a folk singer before. Um, so th- these shows will be with the empty pockets. So, uh, it, it, you know, it's a fuller sound. It sounds more like the records, I think. And how did you guys, um, I know you sort of mentioned it, but um, how did you start working with the empty box? Was it just you played one that got along well? Um, yeah, well, it, it happened in a weird way because, as I said, I was doing this um, acoustic thing. Um, and uh, I, I started uh, doing a co-headline with Gary Wright. I don't know if you remember Dreamweaver, you probably do. Mm-hmm. Um, and Gary and I were doing shows together. And uh, he'd hired the empty pockets to back him up because he he can't play acoustically. He you know he's a keyboard player, so he needs a band. And um, I either I said or they said or somebody said, well, they, there's, you know, Gary's got this band, and uh, would you like them to to learn, you know, a couple of your songs? And I said, fine. Um, so you know, we did we did that, and um, for some reason Gary decided to go off and do something else. Um, and I said, well, that that sounded really, good, really good. Uh, you know, all, the, all these people, none of them were born when Year of the Cat came out. So it, you know, it, it's just a completely different energy on stage because they're all young, or re- compared with me, they are anyway. And um, so we just thought, well, let's do a few more shows together. And that was five years ago, and I think we've now done several hundred. <laughs> so it happened by accident, I think is the answer. Very interesting. It's got to be an interesting dynamic because they're also just their own band as well. You guys aren't playing. Yeah. yeah, they do their own set. Usually they do a set to open the show and then there's an interval and, and then I come out. Um, to me, it looks rather as though, you know, you've got this hot young band and they're playing really, really well. And then for, for no apparent reason, they bring their grandfather on stage with them. Oh. <laughs> uh, that's what it looks like to me. But people seem to like it, so I'm not questioning it. I was going to say, I think there's a lot of to enjoy your music. Um, it sounds like this tour, or this um, you know, grouping of shows, has been a lot of uh, the greatest hits. Um, well, it's hard to say. I mean, there are a couple of songs, you know, that I kind of need to play every night because that's what people want to hear. But for the rest of the show, I I vary it. I mean, I I, I never know until about ten minutes before the show um, what I'm going to play. You know, I, just, I think, oh, let's play this. We haven't done that for a while. and uh, Because it, it keeps it fresher. Uh, I know that there are bands that go out and do the same set every night. They even make the same introductions every night, and that would drive us crazy. So there's a lot of improv goes on. E- expect re- reasoned anarchy. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I was going to say, it's got to be very unusual playing these songs that you've been playing for, you know, so long within your career. Like got to feel pretty particular so it sounds like you get to switch things up a bit keep it fresh oh yeah yeah and and we put new things into the set all the time i mean every time we go out you know they'd learn another song or two and uh you know you try them out uh sometimes it's shocking um I'll, i'll i'll dig out a song that i haven't done 
um, you know, in a very long time. And, and even a fairly obscure one, and audiences hate things they don't know. Um, and I'll give you an example. Uh, we, I think in about 1995 or six, um, I made a, a, an album called Between the Wars, uh, and it was historical songs. Uh, and there was a song on it about, well, God help us, it was about Joseph Stalin um, in hell being tortured by all the dead Bolsheviks that he'd killed. Um, now, but, but it's funny. <laughs> I don't know if you saw the movie Death, Death of Stalin, but um, it was an absolutely brilliant film. And this kind of runs along similar lines in a way. And it's been going down. Um, is, you know, one of the top three songs that I do every night. The reaction to it is amazing. Now, I had not played that song on stage probably for 25 years, and I never thought I'd, I would do it again. I'd just forgotten all about it. And, and I have no idea. Maybe it was the Ukraine war that started it, but I have no idea why I pulled it out and said, let's try this. But um, it's, you know, it's been <laughs> going down a storm. So you never know. You absolutely never know. There are probably other things. I mean, I've written four or 500 songs, so there are probably other ones lurking out there that I should be trying. Um, but certainly this one seems to work. So it, it's, it's lovely when that happens. There was another one I was, uh, there's another one I was doing um, that goes all the way back to an album I made in 1972. And this is a song I hadn't played in 30 years. Um, and I never thought I would play it again. And we, so we started playing it uh, back in, when, when I was doing the acoustic thing. And it became the, it, it actually became the biggest applause getter of the night. I mean, it just totally shocked me because I never thought I'd hear that song again. So um, you never know what people are going to like. I mean, obviously, sometimes you pull a song out that you like and it, people ignore it. They, they, <laughs> they just kind of yawn and cross their hands. But, um, you know, when it works, it, it's, it's actually much more gratifying to have audiences uh, really like a song that, that, you know, they've never heard before and um, never knew existed than it is to play something well known and you know because you expect those to go down well but you don't expect um you know a song about stalin necessarily to go to go down well but it does <laughs> yeah that is what i was gonna ask so you do a lot of historical references you know, that's kind of its own interest of yours um i everybody starts the same way uh all all singer songwriters and probably all musicians start by writing love songs um, it's just a, a rite of passage. Um, and I wrote love songs when I first started out. And then one day I wrote a song, a, a love song that was 18 minutes long, and it was in five different movements because I'm prone to doing things like that. And after that, I thought, well, I've done it. You know, <laughs> it's like, where do you go from there? I can't write any more love songs. And the only thing I was interested in at the time was history. I mean, I used to read history all the time. And... Uh, you know, I'd, I'd been studying the, the Russian front in World War II, uh, and I'd been reading quite a lot of uh, Solzhenitsyn, Russian writer. And uh, so I thought, well, what happens? Uh, what, what would happen if I tried to put all of that into a song? Uh, which I did. I called it Roads to Moscow. And it, that was eight minutes long. Um, and I thought, this has no commercial applications whatsoever. <laughs> Nobody's going to want to hear this. Um, and it became my biggest selling uh, record. In fact, that record that it was on outsold my first four albums put together. And all of a sudden, I was a historical folk rock singer. Um, and I thought, well, my reaction to that was, you know, there's probably room for one historical folk rock singer in the world, and, and I'm going to be it. And I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> uh, it, great job security, because, you know, you're, you're not competing with anyone. I don't know anyone else who could have written Rose to Moscow. Probably only me. So, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's really nice to do something which no one else is doing. I, I mean, it, it gives you much more of a kick than, you know, making a pop song called um, Baby Hold On or whatever. <laughs> you know, it, it's just a whole different thing. Um, and my way of w working has always been like that, which is, uh, I mean, music is, is one thing that I like. I mean, I certainly like music, uh, but it's only one thing that I like. And the songs are equal parts. Uh, influenced by music, cinema, literature, uh, biography, um, and, uh, you know, the lyrics, uh, just in general lyrics, you know, uh, writers. And uh, so what I do basically with the songs is uh, put all of those elements into a bucket and stir. Uh, so the songs come out as being, 
Yeah, I think quite a few of my songs actually sound like movies. They sound like proceeds of movies, uh, I, which again I love. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know what anyone else makes of it, but but I like that, and I like the stories behind all of them too. So uh, I do a fair amount of waffling about you know the background to, to songs on stage, which again people seem to like. So there it is, a, a historical folk rock singer, one of a kind. <laughs> Yeah, very interesting. So it sounds like you you do get to pull a lot of influence from your other interests when you're when you're home or when you're touring. Are you watching movies and then getting inspired? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're, we're forever reading books and uh, you know watching documentaries and things like that. And then you know all, all of this stuff all the time, as well as you know keeping up with you know what other singer songwriters are doing. Um, and uh, you know, what I just, as I say, music is part of what I like, but it's only part of what I like. I mean, I, th- I think the songs are as much influenced by all those other things as they are by, by you know, making records. So yes, uh, I mean, if you came here, the whole place is full of you know, historical novels and, and biographies and things. And uh, you know, at any given time, uh, you might pick something up, and then 20 years later, if you'll think, oh, there's a song there, and if there isn't a song there. Um, an absolutely foolproof way for me to get a song is to is to open an atlas, uh, and I always do it at random. And uh, you know, you'll open it; it'll be China or something. <laughs> and immediately, I mean, I don't know about you, but uh, if I open um, an atlas uh, and I'm looking at a map of China, there there are six songs there immediately. You know, like uh, what you're going to write about? Okay, how about? Uh, Kublai Khan, or, or <laughs> you know, or the Great Wall, or, or any of these things, you know, Mongols, um, and, and, and immediately there it is. I mean, it's, it's right in front of you. You can't, you really can't not be inspired by uh, by Atlas. So, so I, I kept people and say my songs are part historical, but they're also part geographical, because that's a big part of them too. One day I opened uh, an Atlas and I was looking at um, uh, the area around the South Pole. And it turns out that there used to be a continent about 300 million years ago uh, down there, and now it's just a little rocky outcrop in the sea called Kerguelen, although it's French, so it's not pronounced like that. Um, and, and I just happened to open uh, the atlas, and there it was, you know, surrounded by blue. There's, there's nothing within about 2,000 miles of it. I mean, it's the most remote place you could go to. And, and I, I, I thought, oh, there's a song there. And so I wrote a song called The Loneliest Place on the Map. And, uh, you know, I, I really liked that song. But it, it was inspired, you know, just literally by opening an atlas. So that's another way of doing it. That is very interesting. Because I was thinking more like, the, like, the people I know who get very into into history or into a specific movie or whatever, that's what their phase is for a while. And it sounds like you can just pull from something we're into a while ago. Yeah, well, I mean, at, at this stage, I've read so many books that, there's, you know, there's almost nothing that you can't write a song about. I mean, I don't have a, a, a huge amount of knowledge of Bulgarian history, for example, but I could. <laughs> I could research it and do one. Um, so it, it's, I, I, I really, I mean, look, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest this as a career move for anyone who wanted to make money because it doesn't work that way. You, you would have to love it to do it. Uh, if you want to make money, uh, do a song called Hold On. Why? Because there have been 10 songs at least in the top 10 all called Hold On. I think at one point there were two at the same time. But to me, if you're going to um, write a song and call it, oh, let's call it Hold On. <laughs> I mean, either you're incredibly cynical uh, thinking, okay, well, this is the most commercial title, so there's a fair old chance it'll be a hit. Or you're incredibly unknowledgeable about the history of popular music. <laughs> you might think, oh, yeah, that, that's original. Hold on. I bet no one has ever done that before. Um, so that just, I, I, I just had to hear the word hold on in a pop song and I changed the channel. I, I, I just can't deal with it. Um, whereas if you wrote a song about, say, the construction of the Moscow Leningrad railway system in the 1930s, you would have my rapt attention. <laughs> there you go. But I know you said it's it's not exactly what other people are doing so much, but are there any artists that you listen to that you're like, oh, I really like that? Well, probably the, the closest um, artist to, you know, my territory, and you know, because he writes historical songs too, would be Richard Thompson, I think. Um, 
who is a fantastic guitar player as well as being a great songwriter. Um, but, you know, he would be someone I would definitely listen to if he makes a new record. Um, my favorite lyricist was uh, probably Leonard Cohen. Um, they're totally unique. I mean, just nothing like Leonard Cohen had existed before and nothing probably ever will again. Uh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant lyric writer. Uh, I like people who um, are able to do something that no one else in the world is doing. And that would be people like Richard, like Leonard Cohen, uh, like Tom Waits, for example, or coming more up to date, probably like um, Joanna Newsom. Uh, all of them are ter terrific lyric writers, and all of them are completely original and don't sound like anyone else. And in my book, that's the most uh, important thing. So it's certainly the thing I most admire. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you've you've also um, I'll, I'll wrap up here shortly, but I I feel like I have to ask just because it's, it's on your website and I read about you several times. Oh yeah, well all of that all of that stuff's out there, and there are umpteen videos on YouTube and all the rest of it, so it's easy to see what I'm up to. <laughs> well, it's funny because more than once I've seen it listed that you worked with Yoko pre-Lennon. What did you do with Yoko Ono? Oh, I played guitar for her. Um, in her, We're talking 1966, mm -hmm. and uh, Yoko had a yen to uh, record, you know, her making noises, basically. I mean, she called them songs, but um, and so, so she had me tune the guitar to modal D, which is like an Indian raga style. You know, it has it has the strings are used as drones, um, and so I would just you know pretend to be Ravi Shankar, and Yoko would yell over the top. Uh, we recorded hours and hours and hours of music. She used to come around probably about twice a week for about six months, um, and then actually the fun happened after that because then we'd go out to dinner and. Uh, Yoko was extraordinary in restaurants. I mean, she was imperious. <laughs> I mean, I loved hanging around with her because you never knew what she was going to do. On one occasion, we're driving past a, a car dealership in the West End of London. Uh, David Brown uh, made a car called Aston Martin, a very, very famous uh, English sports car. And Yoko was going through a phase where she wanted to sp spray everything white and cut it in half. Uh, and so she said, you've got to stop the car right now. So why? No, just stop the car. I want to I want to go go into that dealership and I want to saw that car in half and spray it white. <laughs> and I, I mean, th this is more fun than you should be allowed to have. I mean, it, 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 all the days really hanging out with Yoko were kind of like that. I mean, you just never knew what was going to happen next. And oddly enough, I'd met John Lennon before I met uh, Yoko Ono. So I'd actually met both of them before they met each other. And uh, then she met John Lennon and, and stopped coming around, and that was that. Um, and my my punchline to the story is one day she met a man with a bigger tape recorder. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I was going to say, because she's definitely somebody that feels like a, a unique person, so it seems like you are drawn to that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you don't want to be... The, the, the thing that ages you more than anything else in the world, in my experience, is boredom. So uh, you, you never want to be bored, um, and you get bored if you do the same thing every single day. You know, uh, hence you know, tell different stories, sing different songs, go to different places. You know, it, it, rather than you know being, you know, the the band that goes out and plays all their hits and then goes on to the next gig. I mean, that's a way to put money in the bank, but but it has probably no artistic soul to it. Okay, so my only other just kind of because I was reading question. Uh, you've also shared an apartment with Paul Simon? Yeah, that's true, too. Um, I think I got lucky in my you know, formative years because I met all these people. Um, I, I was, yeah, I lived actually in the next room to Paul for I was several months anyway. So uh, I was there when he was writing, you know, a lot of actually very well-known songs. And uh, uh, when you finish a song, any singer-songwriter, the first thing they want to do is to play it to someone. So because there was only one one person in the apartment apart from Paul, and, and it was a stupid 19-year-old kid who didn't know anything. It was me. So Paul would come out and very reluctantly play me the songs. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's how you do it. You know, it was a it was a beautiful way of learning. I mean, you, if you're going to learn, learn from the best. You know, and Paul was, it was well, of course, he's Paul Simon. He was brilliant. Um, so just being, a, a, you know, ground zero and watching him write these songs, um, I thought, well, you know, this is a learning experience. I, I'm going to use some of this. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. 
Yeah, it sounds like you got to um, kind of experience a lot of time when you were a young musician, other kind of. Yeah, I mean, we we did we did all these crazy things. I mean, we got backstage to meet the Beatles when they played in our hometown, and uh, we did it by pretending to work for Rickenbacker Guitars. I mean, my friend was sixteen, I was seventeen, um, and the theater manager was so bamboozled by you know like two thousand screaming kids outside his stage door. That um, you know, we we just you know we were pretty convincing. We work for Rickenbacker Guitars. John Lennon is our client, and we can't get through to see him because of all these screaming kids. And the next thing I know, um, there's a police cordon, and, and they're you know pushing everybody back so that we can get through. And then even then, we we get to the stage door, and uh, you know the, Lennon had a roadie at the time uh, who knew, knew we were idiots and was kind of trying to push us down. The, the hallway, and then John Lennon appeared in the in the doorway, and he was obviously bored out of his mind between shows. And so I I asked him why he didn't use his Fender amplifier anymore, and that actually rang a bell with him. And he said, "Oh, they're okay, let them in." <laughs> <laughs> the next thing I know, it gets better. The next thing I know, I'm talking about the Reckonbacker. It was a black guitar he played in in a hard day's night. Uh, the next thing I know is he goes into the dressing room, gets it and comes back and puts it around my shoulders and says, play something. So I played some Chuck Berry riffs. And, I, and you know, at this point, I'm almost delirious. I mean, at the height of Beatlemania in England, and I'm, I'm playing John Lennon's guitar to John Lennon. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, there, there are very, very strange things happened when I was first starting out. Uh, we opened for the Rolling Stones one time. Had to share a dressing room with them because there was only one dressing room. So uh, you know, all these, all this stuff, it makes for great stories. But it all happened, and it all happened very, very early. I was a teenager when all of that was going on. Yeah, that has to be a really strange age to deal with that because I feel like you're either gonna, I don't know, you're going to be embarrassing, you're going to be nervous, you're going to be like all these things around these people that you don't want to be that way. No, no, I mean, but it's it's surprising. Um, one of the things about fame. Um, that has always surprised me is that, I mean, there are some people in the music business who are uppity and snobbish and won't talk to you, but they're all always the kind of the mid-range talents, the ones that, you know, are, are famous but not that famous. Uh, on the occasions when I've met the really well-known ones, like, well, say, Jimmy Page, for example, who I work with, um, they couldn't have been more charming. I mean, they were absolutely go out of their way to be helpful and they're polite and nice, and then you meet some, I don't know, some aging rocker who gives you a hard time. <laughs> and it's why. I mean, it's so easy to be nice. But, um, yeah, I mean, there, there was a very, very famous kind of jazzy rock band, um, and they were on tour, and their opening act, they, every night they made sure that the, the, this poor opening band didn't get any food, and they wouldn't let them play very long, and they wouldn't talk to them. And uh, it turned out that the band that they were being nasty to was the Eagles. <laughs> So, so be very, very careful. You know who who you're, um, you know who who you're nasty to when when they're coming up because you'll see them on the way down. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like it definitely pays to be nice. It, it sounds. Oh, I think so, and it doesn't cost you anything. I mean, it, it, there's no reason not to be. And like I said, the really famous people that, that that I've met have all been nice. You know, it's the it's the kind of the. The ones that are either going downhill or losing the plot, and they're the ones that you've got to watch out for. Weird. Oh, very interesting. Well, uh, I appreciate you talking with me. This has been very interesting. I, I appreciate it. Um, is there anything else you want uh, folks to know before they see you in our nope. nope, not at all. All right. all right, excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time. You are welcome. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.